The Rematz Nevera is not a very good supercar. It is fast, like painfully fast and incredibly clever, but calling it a supercar is a complete misunderstanding of what real supercars are all about. Hey everyone, I'm Stipe and let's talk about that. Is Nevera a good supercar? Let's take the Lamborghini Murcielago SV for instance. I'm sure you'll all agree that this thing is the perfect example of this category. Sure, by today's standard, it's not the fastest, nor is it the most powerful one, but there is more to it than just that. It has drama in theater. The way it goes, the way it looks, the way it vibrates, and of course, the way it sounds. The SV is a full-on attack on all your senses, except for the taste, but you get the idea. Compared to the Lambo, the Nevera is just so one-dimensional. It goes fast and that's it. It doesn't purr, it doesn't spit flames, it doesn't shake you while idling. If the SV is like being at the first row at a Rammstein concert, the Nevera is this pantomime guy. Fantastic, but mute. Nice burnout. Not. All this car has is numbers. It does zero to 60 in 1.85 seconds, quarter mile in 8.6 seconds, and on top of that, a top speed of 258 miles per hour. The brochure then talks about its four electric motors for a combined output of 1,900 horsepower, 1,700 foot-pounds of torque, and on and on and on. Meanwhile, this is what you can read in the brochure for the Murcielago SV. From the heavy rumble of a stormy night, through the trumpeting of mighty elephants, to the roar of a raging lion, the Super Veloce performs the grand opera for 12 cylinders, 48 valves, and 8,000 revs. They didn't say that the sound ranges from 60 to 110 decibels, resonating between those and these hertz. No, they described it as if it were alive. And for us, people who love cars, who give them nicknames and recognize that cars have personalities, a car that feels alive is the one we fall in love with. And this isn't me just being some car Karen complaining for the sake of it. Even Linus Sebastian, one of the biggest tech YouTubers in the world, agrees with me. A guy who loves tech, a self-proclaimed not a car guy, even he understands the role the noise plays when you want to have fun. So I finally understand the car people who drive cars for fun, this is why they don't care about Model 3 or Model Y or anything with a battery in it that doesn't make the noise. And how about those gear changes? Take the LFA, for example, the best sounding car ever. As you accelerate and the revs climb, the roar of an angel becomes screechier, more powerful, more tingly. You feel it going down your spine. The hairs on the back of your neck go up. The heart goes faster and faster. And then you shift up and you get to do it all over again. And then again. And then again, going through the gears is a sensational experience. Without it, even the Koenigsegg Regera feels meh. That car has a mighty V8, but only one gear. So unless you're going way over the speed limit, the only noise you'll hear is a low rev burble, which sounds as if the engine's starving. In the electric cars, well, they don't even have that. But honestly, I shouldn't be bashing only Rimats for this. There are loads of other electric supercars that are relying on numbers only, and as of lately, these numbers seem to be the most important things with petrol cars too. I get it, it's easy to market your car as being better than the competition, that is, if better means faster. If a stopwatch is your only way to measure how good some car is, then there are cars made specifically just for that, just for the stopwatch. Take the Radical SR8 or the Mustang Cobra Jet, for example. Hardly anything will beat these two on their home turfs. But we all know why people like the numbers so much. Bragging rights. Driving around in a 1900 horsepower Nevera or the 1800 horsepower petrol fed Venom F5 means that you're better than the rest, even if there's rarely an opportunity to use its full potential. Also, numbers are an easy marketing tool. All you need to do is write down some digits and that's it. How about instead asking Stephen Fry to describe it in his own words, what zero to 60 feels like? Why does fire come out of mountains? What's the noise that happens when it rains sometimes, that, that thunder, what does it mean? Numbers only matter if you measure them. And do you really drive everywhere with a stopwatch and a G-meter? Do you know that if you ask Rolls-Royce people how much power the Phantom V12 makes, they'll simply tell you, an adequate amount, enough to give you the proper Rolls-Royce experience. 
does it really matter what the number says? And maybe the same should happen with supercars too. Right now, the Mercedes E63S makes more power, and it does 0 to 60 faster than the Zonda F. And honestly, I couldn't care less. And anybody who does is missing the point. Also, focusing on the numbers so much means that other things will suffer. Look at the McLaren Senna, so obsessed with chasing the lap records that it now looks as if it were designed by engineers only, which I could easily believe to be true. What do you think of the springs that are stiffer than Johnny's sins at work? Yeah, you get the brag, but the Senna will make you suffer in the real world. Even my beloved Lamborghini has fallen for this numbers trap when they decided to break lap records at the Nürburgring. Twice. And later they announced a track-only car, which they called the Lamborghini Essence. No, that's not the essence of Lamborghini. This is. First designed to look like a car from outer space, but when that wasn't enough, it received a crazy looking body kit which served no purpose other than to look cool. Even the name, Kuntash, is a swear word, and it means f me dead. Famous first words from the janitor at the Lambo warehouse after he first saw the car. This with its doors opening vertically, with 12 explosions happening thousands of times right behind your back, with an exhaust that will set you on fire if you get too close. A clutch that will give you muscle soreness. A useless spoiler at the back and a naked girl laid over the front of it. That is the essence of Lamborghini. That is a real supercar. But back to the Nevera. Is this a sign of things to come? Sadly, it is. Lamborghini announced that all their future cars will be electrified in some way. Ferrari is talking about electricity too, and even Pagani announced their future cars will be electric also. This is just so wrong. When the Apple Watch came out, it was first of its kind and could tell the time more precisely than any analog watch before it. But do you think that someone who wanted a Rolex went for a smartwatch instead? No. In a way, that analogy can be applied to electric supercars too. The 1.85 seconds to 60 is so fast that it can cause you physical discomfort and pain. Suddenly, 2.3 seconds from a Porsche 918 isn't fast enough? I mean, this is ridiculous, and the Nevera is just the first of its sorts. Are we expected to see even faster times as the technology continues to develop? And do you think that anyone with enough cash will be able to master it? It's enough. Enough with the power wars. Enough of the ludicrous numbers being the hottest selling point. It can only go so far before it becomes unusable in the real world. So let's look at the Nevera from another perspective. As a demo car, it proves a point. Fine, EVs can be quick, but we already knew that. I'm more interested in its range and charging times. How can all-wheel torque vectoring help me with safety? And most importantly, when will this technology be packed into a new Corolla? The biggest push for electric cars is not coming from the performance people, but the tree huggers. And those jerks are wrong for calling Ferraris and Hellcats the gas guzzlers and destroyers of the planet. They aren't. How dare you! A Ferrari 812 Superfast emits 366 grams of CO2 per kilometer, which is more than the 111 grams coming out of a 2-liter Toyota Corolla. But there are only a few thousand of Superfasts on the road, whereas the number of Corollas is in the millions. Besides, the Ferrari will do 1 or 2,000 miles per year only, while Toyotas are driven every day. So do the maths. Who's the real gas guzzler out there? The eco-revolution needs to happen for regular cars that are made for going from A to B, and I'm all for that. Let's all have the silent and comfortable cars that we charge at home for a few bucks. I'm perfectly happy with it autopiloting me to work and back when the roads are super congested, but supercars and sports cars and hypercars? Well, those are toys, and the more fun they are, the better they are. So leave them out of this. Leave them alone. Leave our toys alone! Mate, if you're watching this, I have massive respect for the technology that you've developed, and I love you. You are my Zemo, but I don't love your car. Sorry.